our next speaker, uh, unless you've uh, been under a rock, uh, <laughs> it'd be difficult uh, not to know who Dr. Robert Zubrin is. Uh, uh, Bob Zubrin is the president of Pioneer Astronautics. Uh, he is uh, the uh, creator of a number of innovative ideas in uh, aerospace development. Uh, and most importantly of all, uh, as chair of the NSS Executive Committee, uh, he's my boss. <laughs> So, thanks, thanks. Uh, so I give you uh, Dr. Roberts. Thank you. Lou and I were going to do a switch this morning and play each other. But we we'll need your mic there. Oh, okay. <laughs> my, my. <laughs> So, in terms of the human factors challenges associated with this mission, this was actually much harder than the Mars mission. And, and so there's a lesson here in that a lot of the uh, talk we sometimes get uh, in terms of posing the extreme challenges of the human factors of a three-year mission to Mars are really quite misplaced. And in fact, if you look not only at exploration, but the history of, 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 of men in combat, people in prisons, or refugees in hiding, what you'll find is human factors challenges vastly in excess of that required by a human mission to Mars. And uh, really, you have to say, looking at this, that far from being the weak link on a manned Mars mission, the human psyche is going to be the strongest link in the chain. But that said, what else is there we know from this? Well, this was the first successful Northwest Passage, but it wasn't the first attempt, not by a long shot. There had been over 100 previous attempts. And they all failed. And the interesting thing about them was every one of them had 10 times the money, at least, behind them as the Anderson Expedition. In many cases, 100 times. In the uh, 19th century, the British Navy tried 30 times with fleets of steam-powered warships to penetrate the Northwest Passage, supported by convoys and supply vessels. The Anderson did it in an old fishing boat. They, they went in there with the full mind power of the greatest navy and greatest planning bureaucracy in the world behind them. Breaking ice, getting frozen in, wintering over, eating their way through their hundreds and hundreds of tons of salt pork that they had brought along, and then breaking out in the spring, making more progress, getting frozen in again until the supplies ran out and they'd have to head for home. Now, I mean, the amazing thing is, Amundsen was frozen in for two years on King William Island, which is the exact same island shown here, in the Canadian Arctic that Sir John Franklin, the famous Franklin expedition, with 127 men and two steam frigates, 
were frozen in on in 1847. Now they were wiped out. They perished to the man when they ran out of supplies. Okay? And, and, and then they, they were still frozen in, so they tried to escape over land to the south, but, but they couldn't do it. They had no mobility. And, and, and they dropped on their tracks, man hauling sledges filled with such valuable possessions as very fine Victorian china, um, <laughs> which was dug out of the ice together with many of the men finally in the 1980s. Um, as some of you may recall. Now, Amundsen was frozen in the same place for two years, longer than it took the Franklin expedition to disintegrate. But they didn't starve. They got fat on King William, eating caribou, which abound in the area. Because the Amundsen expedition didn't go into the Arctic with 300 tons of salt pork. It was privately funded. It had to be a pork free mission. They, <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they went in, OK? with a dozen hunting rifles and several cases of ammunition, and men who knew how to use them. And they brought something else. They brought dogs and dog sleds, and men who knew how to use them, and that is an art in itself. And the, um, but that they're essential to give you the mobility required to hunt the very mobile herds of caribou, and of course they can be fed with the same resource. And so what this combination allowed animals to do was not really survive and penetrate the Northwest Passage, but actually explore. The, the, the two Arctic uh, summers that they were frozen in, they didn't sit on the deck of the yellow staring at the ice. They traveled all over the Arctic, hundreds of miles by dog sled, and they made an important discovery as a result. They discovered that the Earth's magnetic poles move. That's a very important discovery in geophysics. It was made by Amundsen, and it was only possible to be made by Amundsen um, because of um, the extremely potent uh, approach to exploration that he took. So the moral of the story here is that if you look at the history of human exploration of the Earth, it has been shown repeatedly that it is possible for a small group of people operating on a shoestring budget to succeed brilliantly where numerous others have repeatedly failed, provided the small group makes intelligent use of the resources that are available in the environment they're going to operate in. Now, how does this relate to Mars? Okay, let's go to 1989. President Bush. Gets on the stairs of the Air and Space Museum with the Apollo 11 crew. And he says, back to the moon, on to Mars, this time to stay. Announces the program that became known as the Space Exploration Initiative. NASA went off, did a study, came back a few months later, 90 day report it was called. And he said, we'll get you there, George. However, we need 30 years and $400 billion. <laughs> okay. Okay. And the reason why, is because the approach, the Death Star. Okay. Thousand meters, not a thousand meters long, a hundred meters long, a thousand tons, mass. One, two, three, four, five big tanks of liquid hydrogen, each weighing 150 tons, each launched to orbit separately by a booster of the Saturn V class. Take a year, in which time a significant fraction would boil off. Never mind. Two nuclear rocket engines, 75,000 pounds of thrust each, pushing on a truss that have to be built in space, which have to take that load, equivalent to 75 cars stacked one on top of each other on a truss standing vertically on the surface of the Earth. A complex payload positioned inside of a 100-foot diameter aeroshell that's going to hit Mars at Mach 30. That aeroshell's got to be built on orbit, which it could be, provided you have on orbit assembly facilities, hangars, Manufacturing facilities, power stations, cryogenic fuel depots, crew construction shacks, checkout points, uh, a parallel universe. <laughs> okay, so, and that, by the way, is where the $400 billion comes in. The Death Star only costs several tens of billions of dollars. It's the parallel universe that costs the real money. Um, now, we at Martin looked at this and we said, look, this is not going to fly. Uh, there's uh, a number of little technical problems associated with this. Well, we won't bring that up to you because you're managers. But even you can appreciate the fact that there is the prayer that these guys are going to get $400 billion to do this. And furthermore, even if somehow by some maneuver one could get it through Congress this year by twisting this guy's arm or that guy's arm, they have to do it again next year. And again the year after, and the year after that, and the year after that for 30 years. Do you think you can maintain the consensus for 30 years to support a program of this character? Not a chance. Well, management being as astute as they are said, well, let's wait and see. 
<laughs> so they waited and they saw, and then he had a lot of credibility. So they said, well, what do you want to do? So what he said is, look, what we need to do from around here is we got to put together a team of our own, a small team, okay, that can develop an alternative method of a sort of use marsh. And we don't want to have a lot of managers or marketeers or people like this come in here and tell us design the mission this way or that way, because we know this guy down at Johnson Space Center or Marshall or someplace who has this particular technology that he really would like to see us include in our mission plan. Hmm. See, because that's why this was so distorted. It wasn't that the people who designed it individually were stupid. They were, for the most part, extremely intelligent people. Very, very intelligent people. But it was a herd of cats, and each one wanted their own thing in the mission, and the particular managerial group that was coordinating this thought it was the best wisdom to include within the mission as enabling technology all the technologies on the wish list, because that way they get the most money. And uh, as a result, they designed the most complex mission they possibly could, which is exactly the opposite of the correct way to do engineering. And as a result, they killed the Space Exploration Initiative by with sticker shock. That's how they killed it, by coming up with a gargantuan plan that was not practical. We said, let's come up with a better way. If you want to get to Mars, someone's got to come up with a better way. And for various reasons, it had to do with certain particular outstanding individuals who were passing through Martin Upper Man at that particular moment in time. Uh, most notably, Al Schallmuller, who had been a hot engineer on the Viking mission and wanted to get back to Mars. <coughs> By that time, he was a vice president, and he gave us the green light. Uh, uh, we were chartered to do this. So a group of 12 people was pulled together, and I was one of them, to come up with an alternative plan. Because this group was uh, composed largely of creative types, we could not agree with each other. And so we developed three different plans for humans to Mars. And one of them was the Mars Direct Plan, which was developed by myself in conjunction uh, with another fellow named David Baker. And it's called Mars Direct for a number of reasons. One of which was it went directly to Mars in terms of the flight plan, and the other was because it went directly to Mars programmatically. We did not go to a detour of building extensive orbital facilities or extensive lunar facilities first because there was absolutely no reason to do that, and that would add enormous cost and overhead to the mission, in fact, so much so that you'd probably never get to Mars at all, in my view. Now, so, we floated that plan in the spring of 1990, and it, it was, of the three, the most radical departure from NASA thinking at that time, and that involved no on-orbit assembly and no lunar precursor. Um, and it rapidly became clear that, um, well, it certainly started the most controversy. It was a, a creating enormous support among those people who really wanted to get to Mars, and a lot of opposition from people who were upset by the fact that we were not including uh, their various technologies, uh, because we went lean, as you'll see. So, over time, since then, the support of it has expanded uh, considerably, uh, and in fact, as, as some people know, it has been mentioned favorably and repeatedly so by, by the NASA administrator since that time, and uh, Actually, by around 93, NASA had incorporated a variant of it into their uh, Mars mission planning and done a pricing of it and discovered that their version of Mars Direct, which was scaled up compared to ours by factor two in terms of crew size and material and bringing in a lot of extra equipment and a lot of heavy equipment, uh, their cost estimate for that, and this estimate, by the way, was done by the same people who did the cost estimate for the 93 report, the exact same people using the exact same models, was 55 billion. And uh, I believe that had they made that mission lean, they could have cut that in half, brought it down more to the $30 billion range. And that, over 20 years, 10 years to develop hardware, 10 years to fly a series of missions, that's, what, 1.5 billion a year, it's 10% of NASA's budget, <coughs> it's entirely doable. It's entirely affordable. Anybody who says, we can't go to Mars, because we don't have the money. It just doesn't know what they're talking about. I mean, $30 billion is less money than Bill Clinton gave to Mexico in an afternoon in the summer of 1995, okay? <coughs> it's less money than spent on any single significant military procurement. One new fighter plane for some particular interception role that you haven't heard of, okay? The, uh, 
There's money like that lying around all over the place, and over 20 years, it's nothing. Okay, the uh, it's less than the State Department budget. Um, now, uh, which would you rather have? Humans on Mars or the State Department? Um, so. Without further explanations, let me talk about how I think we can get to Mars. Not with the Death Star. That's the way not to get to Mars. Okay, you need a launch vehicle. Okay? The simplest launch vehicle is the best. That means heavy lifter, multi-stage, good throw. There's no question we can build it. A Saturn V will do. An upgraded energy will do. Here's a design vehicle together out of shuttle technology. External tank, four shuttle main engines, two solids, and a hydrogen oxygen upper stage. Wham. You can put this together in three years, no sweat. There's absolutely no technological questions associated with this booster. This particular design was designed the way it was, so we could use the shuttle pads that exist at the Cape, and you have an entire infrastructure there of, of, of technicians and so forth who are familiar with all the technology that it's made out of. This can do 120 tons to LEO, which is about in between the current NRDN and the 75. And it can do 47 tons on the direct trans Mars throw. Bang. Okay? And that's how we want to do the mission. Just keep it simple. Lift and throw. Do the manned Mars mission in the same way we've done every unmanned Mars mission to date, or Saturn mission, or the Apollo lunar missions for that matter. Just throw the payload where it's supposed to go using the upper stage of the same booster that lifted it to Leo. But how can you do it? You certainly can't lift a thousand tons to Leo with this. Okay? You lift a thousand tons to Leo, you blow away our land with it when, when you took off. To a friend next year's ISDC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it'd be lovely to watch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 But in any case, um, what can you do? Well, you can invoke advanced propulsions, nuclear propulsion, ion drives, antimatter, warp drive, zero point energy, pixie dust. <laughs> now, some of that stuff. Will work someday. Nuclear propulsion, no doubt. Ion drive, no doubt. Perhaps even antimatter in the distant future. But not anytime soon. And here's the problem you've got. You cannot get to Mars in 30 years. It cannot be done. It is impossible to get to Mars in 30 years. It is impossible to get to Mars in 20 years. You can only get to Mars in 10 years or less. Because the fundamental problem associated with sending humans to Mars is identical to the strategic situation faced by the children of Israel when they attempted to cross the Red Sea. Okay, you got this thing you want to do. You got this hostile army chasing you. A miracle happens. The water is part, and you get these two cliffs of water and a path of dry land in between them. You can now do this incredible thing. But there's these two cliffs of water standing straight up, and you've got to go in between them. And you cannot do that on a 30-year timeline. <laughs> because God's patience is not infinite. <laughs> and Congress is worse. <laughs> You've got to do this quick. If John F. Kennedy in 1961 had said, I want a man on, on the moon by 1990, we would not have gotten there by 1990. We would never have gotten there. Because by 1968, when the administrations changed, the priorities changed, when the Vietnam War and this and that, and we'd be in the first stages of the Mercury flight series, okay, the new administration would come in and say, what's this? And people today would be saying the same thing about Kennedy's dream of going to the moon as they say now about George Bush's call for going to the moon and Mars. It was impossible. It was clearly politically unrealistic. It never happened, obviously. Okay? Well, except he did it right. The other guy did it wrong. Okay? You know, they say uh, everything in history occurs twice. The first time is tragedy, the second time is a farce. The guy who wrote that was actually comparing Napoleon III, a kind of an idiot, to Napoleon I, who whatever you want to think of him was political genius. And in my opinion, Bush compares to JFK in about the same proportion. <laughs> uh, now, um, so how, how do we get to Mars um, with this approach? Okay, here's a mission sequence chart for the Mars direct mission. Okay, 
Uh, now, you'll notice I got some pretty aggressive dates up here. They're not theirs predictions. In the current political environment, they will not be realized. There is no plan to send people to Mars by 2003 in place right now. We could. 2003 is eight years away. It only took three and a half years to win World War II. This is easier, okay? But be that as it may, the point here is what I'm trying to say to you by using these dates is I am not talking about the mission for our grandchildren. I am not talking about a mission for Captain Kirk <laughs> or Picard. You know, you wouldn't want to send Picard to Mars because what would happen is as they approach Mars, he would turn to Counselor Troy and say, well, what do we do now? And Troy would say, well, how do you feel? <laughs> and he wouldn't do it. No, this is a mission for us. This is a mission that can be designed by people who are engineers in the industry today and built by people who are in the astronaut corps today. Okay? And that's what those things mean. So how does this work? In a given year, on this chart, 2001, you fire one of those boosters off the cake. And you use that upper stage to throw on a minimum energy trajectory Mars. It takes eight months to get there. Unmanned payload. There's nobody in it. And it goes to Mars, deploys an aero shell, captures the orbit on Mars, and then lands on Mars with the aid of, 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 of rocket power in a way somewhat similar to what we did in the Viking mission in 1976. Okay, so now you've got a payload on Mars. What is it that we have on Mars? Number of things. The primary object is the Earth return vehicle. Earth return vehicle is a little rocket ship. It's got a little cabin in here, 15 feet in diameter, 16 feet tall, so two decks each with eight feet of headroom. Minimal quarters for a crew of four for a six month voyage from Mars back to Earth, but there's nobody in it now. Then there's two methane oxygen chemical propulsion stages. Chemical propulsion, okay? Not pixie dust, okay. but they're empty. No fuel in them, no oxygen in them. If it was, this would weigh four times as much as it does, and the Aries would never throw it to Mars, okay? Except for some of the lower stage tanks that are later going to contain methane, they got around six tons of liquid hydrogen, probably in gel form. Then slung below this thing, not shown in this picture, is a light truck, a little light truck, like a little pickup truck. It runs on an internal combustion engine, methane and oxygen. Okay? But in the back of the truck is a little duke. Okay? 100 kilowatts, that's like 130 horsepower. Okay? Same amount of power in my 1974 Chevy Nova, which anyone here can have for a very reasonable price. <laughs> You'll see me after the talk. The, uh, so we're not talking here about you know some gigantic nuclear power plant. We're talking about a little putt putt nuke sitting in the back of the pickup truck. Okay? This thing has landed on Mars. They tell a robot to drive the truck a few hundred yards away from the landing site, unwinding a cable off the back on the, the windlass as it goes. Got to drive real slow so with time lag and radio signals between Earth and Mars, but that's okay. We're just going slow here. We've got a big wheel vehicle so that small obstacles are not uh, a big deal. And the um, and you get it a few hundred yards away, then you lower the reactor off the truck, preferably into some little crater or ditch, or just put it on the reverse side of the hill. Anything to put a nice size chunk of dirt between it and the main landing area, then you turn it on. Now you've got to power up the ship. What you do then is you go hunting, marching caribou, carbon dioxide gas. You run a pump to suck it in. Mars' atmosphere is 95% CO2. That's a fact we know from the Viking landers that were operating on Mars four and six years respectively. There isn't a doubt in the world about it. Okay, you can just run a pump, suck it in. CO2 will react with hydrogen in the presence of a catalyst exothermically to produce methane, that's CH4, and water, H2O. Methane, that's natural gas, it's good rocket fuel. You store that, you take the water, condense it, you electrolyze it, split it into hydrogen and oxygen. Okay, the oxygen you liquefy, that's your oxidizer to burn the fuel. The hydrogen you recycle to make more methane and oxygen. Round and round you go. Everyone's here, I presume, is familiar with water electrolysis. It's old hat. The Sabatier reaction, reaction number one on this chart, has been practiced in the chemical industry since the 1890s, and it's actually easier than water electrolysis. Uh, and then to make extra oxygen, you run a third reactor, split carbon dioxide into carbon monoxide and oxygen. The oxygen you store for extra oxidizer, the carbon monoxide you vent and throw away, because you can do that on Mars. There's no EPA there. And, <laughs> and when all is in the, okay, what you've done is you turn your six tons of hydrogen you brought to Mars to 108 tons of methane oxygen on the surface of Mars. Leverage of 18 to 1. It's like being able to buy gas for six cents a gallon, at which cost even the 4.3 cent gas tax is not impressive. 
Um, but anyway, uh, you can try again, or, 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 right, or it's like a pioneer being able to acquire the useful mass of a bison or a caribou for the transport of the mass of several bullets. <laughs> And that's what makes the whole mission sing. 95% of your return propellant is coming from Mars. And in fact, because of that, you make a lot of extra. You make extra to allow operation on the surface of Mars of ground vehicles that use combustion engines. Because combustion engines have a much higher power to mass ratio than electric vehicles running on batteries. So you can have much more speed and hauling capability. Um, things that you really need in a rugged frontier environment, even more than on the civilized environment so to speak, of the highways of Earth, um, where there's filling stations here and there and everywhere, even more there you need the kind of capability that a combustion vehicle offers. Uh, you can't use a combustion vehicle on Mars if you've got to bring the fuel from Earth. That, the logistics of that would be suicide. But if you can make it there, you can do it. And that's the dog sled. That's what makes you potent once you're there. And that's essential too. Because you see, we are not going to Mars just to do it. We're not going to Mars to plant a flag. We're not going to Mars to set a new altitude record for the aviation almanac. Highest flight. 100 million miles. Uh, no, we're going to Mars to explore a planet, to prospect it, to make a extremely important discoveries in natural science as to whether life ever existed on Mars. Because if it ever did there, it exists throughout the universe, and that this is of incredible philosophical importance. But even more, we're going there to prospect this planet to find out if whether or not, regardless of whether or not life ever existed there, whether Mar life is going to ex exist there. Because Mars, as it seems now, does have the resources to support every element needed to support human life and technological civilization. We've got to go there and prospect them. We've got to find the right place for a base. We've got to start it, 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 exploring it. And that means being capable on the surface. A lot of times, it's easy to write chemical reactions like this on a chart. Another thing to do them. That's not true here. This is a full-scale working demonstration that we built at Martin Marietta while I was there. Uh, $47,000, which ordinarily at a major aerospace company will buy you 47 view grants. We built this thing. <laughs> they took three months, a month to design it, a month for the parts to come in the mail, two weeks to actually assemble it, and two weeks to get it running up from 68% efficiency, which it operated at the first day we turned it on, to 94%. And then we just had enough change left to write a report. But the thing here is that not a single person, not me, not Lanny Clark, who's a test manager, nobody on this project was a real chemical engineer. If we can do this, anybody can do it. Really, we didn't know what we were doing. We just knew it was easy, and we did. Um, so what happens next? We make the fuel on Mars. Okay. Now you got a fully fueled Earth return vehicle waiting for it on Mars. It took eight months to fly to Mars, five months to make the propellant. That's 13 months. There's 26 months in between launch windows from Earth to Mars. So long before the next launch window opens up, you know you have a fully fueled Earth return vehicle waiting for you on the surface of Mars. That being the case, the next opportunity on this chart, 2003, launched two more boosters off the Cape. One sent out another one of the Earth return vehicles, another with nobody in it, and another sent out a half with a crew of four astronauts in it. Okay? You see, you don't have to fly to Mars in the Death Star. You don't have to fly to Mars even in the Millennium, Millennium Falcon. You can fly to Mars in a tuna can, <laughs> which is a big plus because we know how to build them. Um, Shape has been demonstrated effective in commerce and to the trade for over a century. Um, okay, except you gotta make it a little bigger. Um, this is 27 feet diameter and 16 feet tall, so you got two decks, each one's gonna have an eight feet of headroom. The upper deck is real habitation space, the lower deck is more of a car cargo hold, uh, workshop uh, kind of uh, garage kind of place. Uh, but they're both pressurized. Here's what the upper deck of the half might look like. Little state room for each of the four astronauts. Number of public areas for science, galley, library. Solar flare storm shelter in the center. Lots of made out of solar flares. They can kill you. Thousands of rounds of radiation to an unshielded astronaut. Could happen unpredictably with a typical frequency on the order of once a year. Takes a few hours, but there it is, a big pulse of radiation from the sun. Gee, that's terrible. How are you going to get to Mars? Simple. The radiation that solar flares are made out of is protons with energies of about a million electron volts. Okay? They can be stopped with five inches of water. 
or it's equivalent to materials in a light world, like food. And it just so happens that the provisions you have to bring on the ship anyway give you enough mass to shield a small area of the ship to more than that extent. That's called the solar flare storm shelter. If solar flare happens, the alarm bell rings, you go in there, and you're safe. You may be stuck in there, it's kind of like riding the A train. Okay. Um, so it's not that comfortable, but you know, I used to live here in Manhattan, and uh, I did it every day. And so if the guys down in Houston can't handle this, we know where we can find people who can. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Now, the, uh, and in general, you won't have to put up with the uh, panhandlers and so forth. Um, anyway, and then the other thing you'll notice here about this hat is that there's um, a conventional layout. Here's a chair, here's a table, there's a seat. This thing's designed for gravity. It can operate with zero gene, it does for a few hours in various parts of the mission. But, it has gravity during most of the mission. We're going to land this on Mars, it's going to be our house on Mars, and obviously there's gravity there. And on our way to Mars, we can make gravity <coughs> by tethering off the burnt out upper stage of the booster that threw us to Mars. That's the upper stage of the Aries. It threw us to Mars, therefore it is going to Mars. It doesn't take more, any more propellant to make that go to Mars. It would take extra <coughs> propellant to make that not go to Mars. And it has no further functionality, it's out of gas, but we can still use it as a counterweight as an end of a tether. Just an ordinary tether, not an electrically conducting tether that will melt itself with 20 kilowatts of electricity, such as recently happened on the shuttle mission. Uh, but just a nice passive tether, nice strong cable. Spin this up. If this thing's a mile long, the tethered satellite tether was 20 miles long. Okay, one RPM to make artificial G in the ham at Mars level. If you spin it a little faster, you can get uh, as much artificial G as you want. Um, so, and the, the point here, by the way, is there's some people going around saying, well, we can't go to Mars until we learn more about the effects of zero gravity on astronauts. We want to study how astronauts' bones thin out over time in this space station. Okay, uh, it's kind of like Nazi doctors. Um, well, we don't need 30 years of Nazi doctor experiments on people fitting out their bones in order to go to Mars. Okay, the, uh, you can just make artificial ground and you can go. The, uh, now, so, what next? Well, we go to Mars. You can go there a little faster than minimum energy is okay. Get there in six months. Okay, the, uh, which by the way, the Skylab that we flew in 1973, cumulatively, had six months wrapped up on its life support system in a one month, two month, and three month mission done in succession. Okay, and, and well, near, of course, is years. Uh, so this is not that big a deal. Now, we get to Mars in six months, cut the tether, upper stage goes by by, we arrow capture to orbit, and land at site number one, where the fully fueled Earth return vehicle is waiting for us. This, by the way, is safer than the conventional plan which you land in your ascent vehicle, because in this case you know that your ascent vehicle has already survived the trauma of landing before you've even left Earth. Okay, whereas in the other case you don't. Anyway, so, and it should be clear, of course, I mean, just to be crystal clear about this, there's no danger of being stranded on Mars because the fuel production didn't work. The fuel production has already been completed before you ever took off from Earth at all. Okay, um, so, um, Anyway, they go to Mars, they air capture into orbit, they land at site number one where the return vehicle awaits them. Now, 1970, we landed within 200 yards of a surveyor spacecraft that had been put on the moon a couple of years prior to that Apollo mission. We got much better avionics and diving systems today. We should be able to land right on the spot, especially since there'll be a radar beacon there to draw them in and down an ace line and thing, and you name it, we got it, okay? But, Let's say it doesn't happen. Let's say they land 30 miles away, which would be a phenomenal landing error. Okay, we're still okay, because we have with us in the lower deck of the cab a pressurized ground roving vehicle, methane oxygen engines, one wing range of 600 miles. Take really piss poor pilots to land outside the surface radius of action of that transportation. And this, by the way, is a big advantage over surface rendezvous compared to space rendezvous. In space rendezvous, if you're off by a kilometer, you're off. Okay, in service line, you go through off by a kilometer, you get out and walk. Okay, uh, it's not a problem. Anyway, so let's say we land even beyond the 600 mile limit of the ground transportation. 
I mean, this would be sort of incredible. But let's say we you know, wrong side of the planet. <laughs> Major problem with the pilot selection process. <laughs> You're still okay. You got the second return turn vehicle following you out to Mars. And wherever you land, that can be landed in your view. And that one will be done right, it's going to be automated. <laughs> now, in this case, okay, you depend upon the chemical synthesis process to work real time instead of a past tense operation, which is the, the baseline of the mission. But this is a third level mission backup. You got a crew on scene to correct the chemical equipment should it fail. Though you should probably exclude the pilot from that operation. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, and there you go. But it's a third level backup. And we got a fourth level backup, which is that if all this fails, the whole crew has been landed on Mars where they got natural gravity, where they got substantial radiation protection from the Martian environment, and they got enough supplies within the last three years. So if everything fails, the fourth level backup is just tough it out on the surface of Mars until the next launch window opens up and two more boosters can be fired out at that time with more supplies and no return vehicle. So what you got to do is a four-layer defense in depth on the mission, and each layer involves carrying off the mission. Each layer involves essentially some level of mission success. This is not how we get Apollo. On Apollo, we are ready to cut and run up to seconds before the actual human landing. That's what's known as an abort tree. You can't do that at Mars. You're much more committed. You're much more uh, away from home. You've got to be prepared to carry the thing through, and that's the <coughs> philosophical logic behind this mission plan. Okay. So, but let, let's say it works, okay? Let's say you land where the thing is. What do you do with that second Earth return vehicle? Well, you could land it anywhere else you want, but the best idea is to land at a significant distance away, but within the driving range of your ground transportation. A few hundred miles, perhaps. So it starts being propelled to open up a new site, but the crew at site number one has access to both Earth return vehicles. They got completely redundant systems to take them home. They can kick the tires before they come in. And they got three houses to live in while they're on Mars. They got the head, they put Mars in, and they got the cabins of the two Earth return vehicles, as well as short term life support within the pressurized ground room. Now, so this is landed somewhere else. It starts making propellant, which will support the next mission, which will fly out there two years later, along with another Earth return vehicle, which is their backup, which otherwise opens up site number three. That's two boosters every two years. That's one per year. This, these things will be about as hard to launch as the shuttle. The shuttle is a heavy lift launch vehicle. The problem with it is that 80 tons of what it launches to orbit is inert mass that comes down again. It's actually 100 tons of the old booster. And this thing would be about as hard to launch as that. And we get shuttles off at a rate of 60 a year in a bad year. So that is one sixth of our heavy lift capability required to support humans to Mars. And I say, given the fact that we've got a space agency that's charged to explore space and has a large portion of its budget supporting human activity in space, it's entirely reasonable that it should take one sixth of its launch capability to commit it to opening up the red planet for human beings. So here, this is an actual photograph. <laughs> most of you know about it. <laughs> I've been working with Pete Worden on this. We're already at, no, uh, not quite. Um, this is a depiction of the Mars base. Okay, there's your return vehicle, cabin upstairs, two methane oxygen propulsion uh, stages. The chemical plant is built right into the landing stage, which also acts as your takeoff uh, pad for going back just like the, the, the land that was used in Apollo, the landing stage is the takeoff pad for the ascent stage. There's the reactor with the crater in the background. There's a two camp half, upper deck sanitation, lower deck to the garage. A couple of photovoltaics they take out with them to give auxiliary power. If we need to turn the reactor off, we still have enough power for life support with the photovoltaics. This is a pressurized greenhouse. It's, it, well, it's an inflatable greenhouse, rather. Uh, it's not pressurized with the full earth pressure. Uh, but it, 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 it keeps plants warm, and they're doing experiments on growing crops uh, on the surface of Mars. Okay. With the extra fuel that we need, 12 tons of extra fuel beyond what the Earth return vehicle needs, we can drive that ground rover 16,000 miles. Not 16,000 miles away from the base, it has a one-way range of 600 miles, which means a sorting range of 300 miles max. But we can wrap up 16,000 miles on the odometer while we're there. That's a reasonable amount of exploration. We're going to be there 500 days. That's an average amount of, of, of driving 32 miles a day, 16 miles out and back. With that, we can do a fair amount of exploration. And let me just say something about this. As far as natural science is concerned, okay, number one question with respect to Mars is was there ever life there? 
And in all probability, we're looking for fossils. Okay? In all probability, there's not life on the Martian surface because of the hostile conditions there. But putting aside interpretations of vitamin results, um, which also support the fact that it, if life is on the surface, it certainly isn't apparent. Uh, now, so you're looking for fossils. Are you going to find fossils with robots? Well, let me tell you something. I live in Colorado. It's dinosaur heaven there. Okay? I live a few miles from a place called Morrison. If anybody reads books by Stephen B. Jew, Stephen J. Gould, or other popular paleontologists, they'll read all about the Morrison formation, famous for dinosaur fossils. Well, let me tell you something. Okay, I'm not a native, but I have been there eight years, and I have yet to find a single Tyrannosaurus myself. Or even a Triceratops, okay, which were there in the millions. They were herd animals like bison. In fact, for that matter, I haven't found any fossil bison. They were there 150 years ago. Okay, the fact of the matter is fossils are rare because they're created by a freak of an organism living in the environment, being cut off from the environment at the moment of death, and then being revealed to the environment right before you come along two billion years later. Because if they're revealed to the environment a million years before you come along, the environment's destroyed them. Okay? So you really have to have mobility. You've got to explore. And you've got to actually have a whole set of intuitive capabilities. Uh, anybody here believe you'll ever find dinosaur fossils by parachuting cameras down into the Rocky Mountains? Give it a try. Ain't gonna work. Okay? Or little rocky rovers like the one on Pathfinder? Never happen. You've got to get the rock hounds out there. That's why human explorers have got to be there. So with this scheme, we've got the mobility and the time because we made extra oxygen, which can be used to back up the life support system massively. The closed the life support system fails, we've got tons and tons of extra oxygen to back up. We've got extra oxygen to combine with hydrogen from Earth to turn it into water at 9 to 1 leverage. And if you've got water, you can turn dehydrated food into hydrated foods at 3 to 4 to 1 leverage. That's what makes this whole thing work. Now, we also explore. We want to paint into the ground. Okay? Shortwave radio, you can penetrate a kilometer down. You know, a lot of the leading Mars geologists think there's probably a liquid water table on Mars, 500 meters or a kilometer down. In some places, it could be even higher up than that. You know what? That means in certain places on Mars, it's very likely it could be geothermal power that can be tipped. Do you know that geothermal power is the number four source of power on Earth after combustion, hydroelectric, and nuclear? Much more important than solar energy or wind. Iceland gets all of its power from geothermal. Okay? You tap down you drill a single geothermal well on Earth typically produces 10 megawatts. That's 100 times what you're likely to get from a 100 kilowatt nuclear reactor and much more than you're going to generate on some solar power on either the moon or Mars. Hey, you find that, you drill down and tap into that, you've got power for a base, you've got liquid water, and also, incidentally, you've got the most likely place you're going to find life on Mars, which is in subsurface heated water. Do you want to explore? Now what else we got here? We got a transparent greenhouse on the surface. Now think about this for a minute. Because there's a big misunderstanding in the space settlement community over which is the target for settlement, the moon or Mars. And some people think that the moon is a place that you settle, but Mars is just a place where scientists can go and explore and find out some interesting things that we don't know about yet. They have it completely backwards. Completely backwards. Because the moon is missing more than half the elements required for life and for technology. It's missing carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen. It's also missing phosphorus and sulfur. It's missing copper, crying out loud. Okay? They, Mars has them all. But in addition, Mars got sunlight on a 24-hour cycle. You can't grow plants on a 14-day, 14-day on, 14-day off light cycle. They won't accept it. Furthermore, on the surface of, of the moon, you got solar flares. Mars' atmosphere is thinner than it is and effectively mask out solar flares, which means you can have thin wall transparent greenhouses on the surface of Mars. If you wanted to go crops on the moon, you'd have to do it underground with artificial light. Let me tell you something. Plants are enormous, enormous power hogs. You cannot grow plants with electric light. You have to grow with natural sunlight. A single square kilometer on Earth uses as much sunlight power as a thousand megawatt nuclear plant. Okay? Eight square kilometers, an area a mile, uh, two miles on side, uses as much power as New York City. The state of Rhode Island, a noted agricultural giant, uses as much sunlight power to grow the crops that grow there as the entire electrical production of the human race. Okay, so the only, if you're going to colonize, you need a place where you can grow crops in the light of day, and Mars is that place, in addition to the fact that the hydrogen, carbon, and nitrogen needed to make the plants are there and are not on the moon. Let me tell you something. 
People say they may have found some ice in the pole of the moon. I think it's a little uncertain on that, but you need more than water. You need carbon, you need nitrogen. These are not on the moon, for sure. The planet on the present on Mars. Do you want to see how impoverished? I compare Mark, the moon to Mars as Greenland to North America in the age of exploration. That is a grossly understated statement. Let me just put it to you this way. Because of the absence of carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen on the moon, in fact, they had to be transported there from off the planet, and you look at the cost of transporting things into a place from off the planet, what that means is on the moon, shit would be more valuable than gold. <laughs> so think we'll be throwing away next time you're going to the toilet. Okay, that is how totally impoverished a place the moon is as a location for colonization compared to Mars. Okay. Now, you're on Mars for a year and a half, because that's the amount of time it takes for the planets to move around, okay, and get a good shot for return window to Earth. NASA's early plan in the 1984, they adopted a different kind of trajectory called an opposition class trajectory, which is dashing out to Mars, planet flag, running home. In addition to accomplishing no exploration of Mars, it doubled the mass of the mission because the delta Ps increase if you try to do it that way. If you do it right, not only do you get in a fair amount of exploration, and it just makes sense to spend a comparable amount of time on Mars as you're spending in transit. And the mission plan here is that six months out, six months back, a year and a half on the surface. A year out, a year back, two weeks on the surface makes no sense at all. Okay, if the weather's bad, you don't even get to land, <coughs> uh, which is a real trap. Okay, but anyway, we're on the surface a year and a half. We can thoroughly explore the area on Mars, and then we get in the Earth's return vehicle. We put the key in the ignition, we start her up, and we go home direct to Earth. We don't have to rendezvous with any mothership in Mars orbit. There is no mothership in Mars orbit. We don't have to rendezvous with the space station. We could, I suppose, but the Pacific Ocean is an easier target, and the ride home is a lot cheaper too. Fishing boat instead of space shuttle. Check it out. Uh, check out the rates while you travel. Um, anyway, but we leave behind on Mars the habitat, the greenhouse, the reactors, power cells, all the rest of the stuff. Is that bad? I mean, gee, you know, single stage to orbit, we're trying to bring back everything we sent up. Well, that makes sense for single stage to orbit. But when you go to Mars, you don't want to bring back all the stuff we sent there. We have a lot of stuff here already. The whole idea of going to Mars is bring as much stuff there as you can and come back with as little as you can. Because that way you build up a, a capability on the Martian surface. Just to explore an area about the size of Texas, you can see, by the way, that Texas is a tiny place compared to Mars. Mars is big. Okay? That's another point you have to understand between Mars and the moon. Mars is much, much bigger than the moon. The moon has a total surface area the size of Africa. Mars has a total surface area the size of all the continents of Earth put together. Not just Africa, North America, South America, Asia, Europe, Australia, <coughs> Antarctica. Okay? And it has an incredibly more varied history to it, which means there's an incredible more variety of things to be found over this vastly larger place. Okay? And you can see even after eight missions, we only explored a, a small fraction of it. But we also see here, the radius of those circles is 300 miles. So that's the radius of actually the ground over. If we didn't have the capability of living off the land, if our degree of mobility was a tenth of this, 30 miles with an electric powered vehicle instead of 300 with a combustion vehicle supported by local resources, how, look how tiny those, those circles would be like points on that map. You wouldn't explore anything. Unless you're prepared to live off the land right, right from the beginning, there's no reason to go at all. Now, first thing we do when we go to Mars, we explore. When we solve the questions of natural science, we prospect. We find the best resources. We locate a geothermal power source. We locate the best sources of ore and of relatively pure ice. There's water on Mars. I mean, there's a lot of water on Mars. The current estimate from geologists is that there's enough water on Mars in permafrost that if the planet was smoothed out and the water was melted out, the planet would be under an ocean 600 feet deep. Okay, now that's probably compared to the Earth. If the Earth is smooth, we'd be under 6,000 feet of water. But the Earth is what a world. But if you got rid of the Earth's oceans, Mars is about as wet as the Earth. So there's enough, certain, absolutely enough water on Mars to support an active biosphere. In contrast, on the Moon, if there was concrete there, lunar colonists would mine it to get the water out. <laughs> okay. So we explore, we find a location to put a base, based on exploration. In other words, you don't just go to Mars and just start building a base. You go to Mars and do some serious exploration of the type you can only do with humans. And then what you do is you start landing a lot of the camps all in one place and build up to create a significant base. Why? 
Exploration can be done by very small groups of people scattered over very large areas. In fact, that's the most efficient way to do it. But exploitation, the ability to develop techniques to master the raw materials on Mars and turn them into resources by developing the technologies, by developing means of extracting water from permafrost if you can't get it from a geothermal well, of making growing crops, of making ceramics, glasses, plastics. You can't make plastic on the moon. Okay, the material for it is there. You can make it on Mars. It's an enormously handy material. Make plastics, make metals, make wires, tubes, habitats. Okay, if you can develop those techniques, then you can develop the ability to support a human colony. Okay, and we can open up Mars as a place. We develop the know-how, then Mars becomes a place that can support a new branch of human civilization. Now, what about the moon? Is the moon completely useless? No, it's not useless. It's just much less useful than Mars. It's something we can take care of in time because it's a good place to put astronomy, uh, astronomical telescopes. It's entirely a secondary objective. It's not a place you go in order to go to Mars. It's a place you go after you go to Mars to do certain interesting things that you can do, given the fact that you have all that technology in here to build a lunar base once you've gone to Mars. Okay? That is, you use the same elements that we're using to build Mars Direct. You can also build a lunar base if you want one, and eventually we will to house astronomical observatories of superb character. The relationship is precisely that between the Apollo missions and Skylab. We didn't need to build a space station to go to the moon. That was a bureaucratic myth, which fortunately was overthrown by the people who knew that they had to get to the moon and they didn't have time to waste on this nonsense. Okay, but once they went to the moon, they were able to put up a space station in an afternoon, the Skylab, a much bigger space station, and at much less cost than uh, the current space station uh, plan. In fact, they already spent more money on space station freedom, or whatever it's called now, by factor three, without building it, than they spent on the entire Skylab program end to end. That's accounting for inflation too, by the way. Anyway, we can use the same modules that we sent to Mars, to send to Moon, to create our observatories there. But once again, you've got to understand this. Mars is the new world, okay? Mars is the North America of the future age of exploration. The Moon is Greenland, or even more impoverished than that relative to this. If you want to build a settlement, if you want to create a place where people are going to be able to live and develop something new, a new and glorious branch of human civilization based on ingenuity and practicality and coming up with new and better ways of doing things because that's what they're going to be forced to do because that's what the frontier does to people, okay? Mars is the place to do it. So, in summary, with this approach, this is the set of tools you need to establish human bases on the moon and Mars. Mars first, moon when you have time. You'll kill the program if you try to go to the moon first because you'll bore the public to death. Going to the moon is like kissing your sister. Okay? It's not the formula for wrong music. No, anyway, I'm not kidding about that. That's another thing that killed the 90 day report. Because we've been to the moon. We really have. And you want to know why we stopped going to the moon? Because there wasn't enough interesting things to do there. Well, there's a hell of a lot more to do on Mars. Now, there's some more stuff they could have done on the moon. But Mars is really where we need to go. Now, these tools, a good booster with a good growth stage with pro payloads by the moon or Mars or asteroids for that matter, a half module that you can use on the moon or Mars and like insulate it differently for each environment, and an Earth return vehicle that can come back from either. To come back from Mars requires more propulsion so you have an extra stage, but you can make a few on Mars, so actually it's easier to come back from Mars between the moon. And then an aero shell. You wouldn't want to use the aero shells on the moon unless they were made in a politically significant district. So, <laughs> Okay. Now, as I said, in 1989, NASA was obtuse about this, and they chose Battlestar Galactica and they destroyed the program. But over time, enough people there have become convinced that if they're going to go, they got to go, what's the term, quicker, faster, cheaper. Okay. And they took a look at this, and they found that indeed, even doing it their way, which was not the best way, I call it Mars semi direct they, uh, they were able to come in at $55 billion, roughly the cost of the space station program. It, it's something we absolutely could do. And in fact, this picture, this is uh, Dan Golden, this is me, this is the Mars propellant maker. Um, you know, and uh, this picture really shows what you can do with a disposable camera and a Xerox machine. <laughs> um, anyway, the fact of the matter is if a program
president was to get up right now and say, I want to send humans to Mars, I don't think he would get the answer back 30 years and $400 billion. He might get back 12 years and $55 billion. Hopefully, he'd get the answer back eight years and $30 billion. But he'd get back an answer that makes us affordable. And I'll tell you something else. I have taught this thing around the country, not just to people like you, space people, but to Rotary Club, Commerce Conventions, you name it, I've talked to them. And the main question I get from people is, how come we're not doing this? This is the sort of thing this country ought to be doing. I remember Apollo, that was great. How are we supposed to go to Mars after that? How come there was no follow through? This is the sort of thing this country ought to be doing. There's a disconnect in the beltway. And if any politician ever had the guts to get up, as John F. Kennedy did in 1961, and 62, and 63, and call for this program and fight for this program to be a Napoleon the first, not a Napoleon the third. Okay? You know, not to do for this what, what you know what George Bush did for the Kurds. Um, he would find himself a enormous base of support because we can do it, and I believe that the American people want to do it if it's simply posed to them. So to conclude, and this is in fact the message that you need to bring out in your talks, you know. Using this slideshow that we've set up, I think everybody knows about it by now. You've got to go out and talk to people about this because there is an enormous reservoir of support and we can make it happen. You can make it happen. I can't make it happen by myself, but you can make it happen. So I'm going to conclude with a quote, and this is one that I drew from a book called The Plymouth Plantation by William Bradford, the leader of the Pilgrims. He wrote this book in 1621, a year after the big fire landed. Okay? And uh, what he's writing about here is, is the debate that erupted among the pilgrims when they were in Holland. And they didn't like the way things were going there. And they didn't know what to do about it. And somebody came up with this wild suggestion that what they ought to do was relocate the whole congregation to North America from the civilized Netherlands, the islands of North America. Okay? Because it may be rough there, it may be inhospitable, the place may be filled with savages and they're dreadfully cold, but at least there we could cut our own path. At least there we could make our own world. And this is what he said. He says, this proposition, relocation to America, being made public and covered to the scan of the law, and raised many variable opinions amongst men, and caused many fears and doubts amongst themselves. Some, from their reasons and hopes conceived, labor to stir up and encourage the rest to undertake and prosecute the same. Others, again, out of their fears, objected against it, and sought to divert from it, alleging many things, and those neither unreasonable nor improbable, as that it was a great design, and subject to many unconceivable perils and dangers. It was answered that all great and honorable actions are accompanied with great difficulties and must be both enterprise and overcome with answerable courages. And I put that up there because it's got to be understood that that and nothing less than that was the kind of sheer moxie that it took to establish European civilization in North America. And, and that and nothing less than that, absolutely nothing less than that, is, is going to be what is required to establish the first human settlements on Mars. Because look, let me tell you, Mars Direct is the cheapest Mars mission plan that anyone has ever come up with. It's also the safest. Everything is completely integrated on the ground. We got the storm shelter, we got the artificial gravity, we got two complete redundant urban turning systems, we got three places to move on Mars, we got this, we got that. But there's no question this is going to be risky. You can't do this without risk. It is going to be extremely risky when we fly to Mars the first time, whether we do it my way in 2003 or somebody else's way in 2003. But if you look at human history, and it doesn't matter whether you're looking at 380 years ago or what was done 52 years ago, this one thing is, is extremely and perfectly clear, and that is that nothing great has ever been accomplished without courage. Thank you.
question. Uh, the question was, uh, isn't uh, the process of creating, uh, generating artificial gravity uh, going to be difficult and require further experimentation? Is that fair? Uh, Uh, well, actually, uh, the question was already answered by someone from the audience. In fact, the, uh, the operation of two tethered spacecraft in conjunction with each other was demonstrated in the 1960s on Gemini. The physics of artificial gravity is straightforward. It's not a gravity field like in Star Trek. It's just centrifugal force. And uh, it's the same physics as a kid whirling a bucket of water over his head. Yep. Yeah, the decision to use LOR for going to the moon was finalized in July of 1962, and then Apollo 11 landed almost exactly seven years later. So isn't it conceivable that if your plan is finalized, let's say right around now, we could perhaps land on Mars, say, that test seven years from now? That's roughly the schedule that's feasible. Uh, but in fact, for us to go to Mars right now is much easier than it was to go to the moon in 1962. That's that really has to be understood. To go to the moon, starting from 61 or 62, we had to develop multi-stage heavy lift launch vehicles, hydrogen oxygen propulsion, in-space rendezvous, space suits, in-space life support, soft landing systems, re-entry systems, et cetera. About 85% of the technology required to go to Mars was developed in order to go to the moon. And uh, for us to go to Mars right now is actually, even though the moon is, Mars is farther than the moon and all that, technological challenge of what we have to do compared to what they have to do is so much less. So in fact, we could be on Mars in a shorter schedule than that. What would a successful lunar prospector technician do for your prospects? Because I know you're similarly looking at similar financing through multimedia and... Maybe the lunar core. Not a little prospect. I'm sorry. Look at them. You met you. Oh, yeah. okay. What would they do for our mission? I don't know. Well, sure. Look at the prospects. If they were successful in, in, in doing an unmanned rover mission yep. and demonstrating the, the yep. profitability of, of the theme park scene, that type of thing, what would that kind of results do for the, the prospects for your Obviously, it would make our mission look that much more feasible. The, the basic concept behind them both is commercial rather than government. Um, technically, we're looking at using perhaps one of the Lunar Works rovers, because by the time we get there, they, they may have worn off some of the entertainment aspect of it, and we're planning to use something like that, if not theirs, to help us with some of the technical difficulties of living on the moon like burying our habitat. Okay, uh, one second. Uh, I've been asked to make just a brief announcement that the NSS town hall meeting uh, is starting shortly in Baldwin C. Feel free to remain uh, as much as you like. We're going to be available for questions here. Uh, but just that brief announcement uh, uh, in the back there. Would dust storms on Mars be a problem? Uh, the question was, will dust storms on Mars be a problem? Dust storms on Mars are a big problem for trying to land very well. Okay, because you can have winds of uh, 100 miles an hour, and if you're an aerodynamically dominated object, like something coming in on a parachute, uh, that's a serious problem. On the other hand, if you're on the ground on Mars, the dust storm is not that big a problem, because the Martian atmosphere being as thin as it is, 1% as thick as the Earth, um, 100 mile an hour wind there has the same force as a 10 mile an hour wind here. And the Viking landers on the surface of Mars survive numerous dust storms without uh, I have a question on the Artemis magazine. What will the Artemis magazine consist uh, of as uh, to contact? Artemis magazine is going to be a consumer magazine of half science and half science fiction. Um, the science fiction is going to be near term, near earth hard science fiction. Science fact is going to be, well, basically, if you put all the articles together, you're going to have a handbook that somebody who wanted to build, go to, and live in a moon base would need to know. Um, should be available on newsstands and hopefully very interesting. And even if we don't get to the moon, it will be an interesting magazine that you'll probably want to read. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, on the Mars Direct, what can we do to help facilitate this? What you can do is at every opportunity harangue anyone with any degree of political connection or the congressman, <laughs> or congressional aides, or write letters to the editor, or so forth, and make it clear that this is what you think this country ought to be doing. That See, these guys inside the Beltway, 
have accepted this notion, for the most part, that the American, America has entered the age of limits. Okay? And that they believe the people believe that. Or that's actually more important. They don't really know anything. But they believe that the people have believed that. And that's what they care about. They don't really care whether it's true or not. Uh, and therefore, you get the liberal side, which is we should uh, shape, straighten out the ship and care about national health care. And you got the conservative side, which is straighten out the ship and care about the budget. Okay, and nobody will be able to do anything. Now, I'll tell you something. I don't think the American people believe that or are willing to accept the notion that we've entered the age of limits. And in particular, the idea of pushing the frontier into space is something that there's a lot of support for. And that needs to be conveyed to these politicians. Okay, they need to know that they get a whole lot more bang for their speeches if they talk about pushing the infinite frontier than if they talk about repealing the 4.3 cent gas tax. Free soft drink with every fill up. One <laughs> thing I want to add, I pretty much agree with everything Bob has said, at least here today. And uh, the uh, one other factor not mentioned though today uh, is the international factor which is, I think, going to play a large part in this. If you read every poll that's ever been done in the last five years, at various time of the Apollo anniversary, times of the, the uh, uh, big cover stories on space happenings, you see that you get about a 55-45 type of split up asking uh, Americans, do they support a particular venture in space? Do they support uh, humans going to Mars? In particular, that was done uh, Time Magazine and CBS independent polls. And that's and depending on the way those questions are phrased, it's either 55, 45 against, or if you ask it about in terms of budget dollars, you might even get 55, 45 the other way. I think I said four and against and opposite. Now, uh, if you ask a question, do you support it as an international venture among all nations building this together? Uh, you get a much a much different answer. You get about three to one and four for it. And I think that was another element that was missing out of the Space Exploration Initiative. It was a return to the old war, uh, the old idea of the nationalistic venture. And it was also uh, missed out the whole legacy of Apollo. It's ironic that Apollo's legacy is that we came in peace for all mankind. When, of course, we all know why the Apollo program uh, was not a program conceived out of peace and it was not a program conceived for all mankind. But the legacy is with us, and I think that is a po still a popular image. It's going to play a large part in the international, in the justification and rationale for the types of programs Bob is envisioning. And um, it ought not to be lost. It's a real challenge then to take that as a simple rationale statement and construct programs that do it. The uh, thing that's going on, and I mentioned Mars Together, is a, uh, an important step. The International Space Station is uh, a, a crucial step. And these are, the International Space Station is enormously significant in this regard. It's the largest engineering project in the history of the human species. And it's being conducted as an international activity. Uh, and I think we'll, uh, uh, you'll have to pick this up and stick it into Mars Direct, but I'm just as excited as Bob is about that. Okay, we've got a whole bunch more questions here. Yes. Uh, question for Bob Zuber. Have you given any thought to uh, the Navy packaging a, an audio tape of one of your Mars Direct speeches, for instance, the one you gave last year, and possibly even some slides and making those available to people who might want to use them, for instance, as a follow-up speech or ideals for a follow-up speech uh, with the different rotary clubs and stuff like that? Well, okay. First of all, okay. As most people here know, I've been producing a lot of magazine articles about this over the years. Uh, and I've now gotten a book out, or it will be out in November, called The Case for Mars, The Plan to Settle the Red Planet for a Reason We Must, which should give anyone more than enough material, at least in terms of ideas, uh, to go out and give such talks. Now, the National Space Society has produced a slideshow to give talks, and of course, <coughs> People saw it, showed it the other day. Uh, it's a general thing that covers the whole gamut of what we want to do in space. Now, I think you bring up, uh, because we wanted to get a single slideshow to, to cover the big tent of, of our organization, which has Mars advocates such as me and, and many other people with other concerns. But I think that perhaps uh, if, if people react to this and start carrying out this message, perhaps we can start putting out some specialized slideshow, including a Mars Direct one. 
so that those of you who want to go out and mobilize people specifically for Mars, which is an activity that I enthusiastically support, uh, <laughs> will have every tool you need in the rate of uh, first-rate uh, uh, visuals uh, to, do, to do exactly that. But uh, um, we'll see about, about, uh, about doing that. Uh, but there is the book coming out in November. I also have a website where you can get a lot of my technical papers. Uh, it's um, http colon slash slash www dot magic, M -E -G -I -C -K dot net N -E -T, slash Mars. So magic dot net slash Mars. Magic is a name. Oh, the, the book? Yeah. It's the free press. It's the division of Simon Schuster. Dr. Zipper's ideas with I'm going through the soil and the uh, the question is, would the ideas find fertile soil in Japan? And perhaps it might. I have occasionally been interviewed by a Japanese journalist. Presumably the reason why they're doing that is because people there are interested in such things. Uh, I don't know if I agree entirely with Lou on international cooperation. Uh, well, let me put it this way. I would 100% support a mission done by international cooperation. I have no problem with that at all, and if we can get the nations in the U.S. and Russia in particular, and possibly Japan, Europe, to all get together and want to do this, I think that'd be fantastic. But historically, it's also been the case that competition has been an even stronger motivator for people to do extraordinary things. And Japan, you know, is a nation which has essentially uh, written off the uh, military option as a way of expressing national greatness. And, but it is one that wants to express national greatness. It is a crowd of people with, with tremendous capability and ingenuity. And perhaps there might very well be the, a push there to do something like this. And if they did that, then perhaps a US program could emerge in response, or perhaps at that point, the US could offer to cooperate with that one. Uh, I'm not political in the sense of which way I prefer to go to Mars. And by the way, there's a a New York Times magazine article out which uh, proposes a certain way of getting to Mars in which uh, he did speak to me, but he mischaracterized my, my statements in many respects uh, in that, yeah, I sure would support a Mars prize being offered, but I absolutely do not want to, in his words, ditch NASA. In fact, if there was a Mars prize offered, probably about a third of the investment money would be spent in NASA to various technical expertise at the Cape, at Johnson Space Center for Life Support, at the Deep Space Tracking Network, at NASA Ames for Thermal Protection Trust. That is one of the major places you go shopping. You funnel private money into NASA, but into the healthiest parts of NASA doing real technical work. I support the Mars Prize. I support an international mission done by a consortium of space Ferry nations or even the United Nations. And I support John F. Kennedy approach too. Uh, the, uh, it's whatever works as far as I'm concerned. Okay, uh, uh, yes, every April 15th, I see an annoying little box on the bottom of my tax return that says, uh, would I like to throw a dollar into the presidential campaign? I don't care too much about that. But if I saw a box that said, would I throw 10 or $50 into the space program, I'd check it every time. I'm wondering if uh, NSS has ever considered this kind of approach. It takes a little more pull than we have to get that check on. <laughs> NSS has considered it was uh, proposed about uh, 10 years ago and didn't get too far. <laughs> yes, I'm a political representative. Uh, have you been in communication with the Space Studies Institute at Princeton? And um, have you incorporated any of their scenarios for lunar mining into your, some of your long range plans? Uh, we have members, including uh, Red Whitaker, Carnegie Mellon, uh, Jim Dunson, who, who, who uh, attend the yearly meetings and uh, know a lot of the folks involved with Space Studies Institute. Um, we all have an interest, particularly in, in the potential of mining helium-3. And there is an interest now at Johnson uh, Space Center, NASA, of the production and transport of oxygen on the moon. And there is some study work being done there, and Johnson's, in fact, very interested in our mission to do precursor work for that. Um, but specifically, um, 
I don't think we're in regular contact with, with, with somebody at the Space Studies Institute that's specifically working that issue. If you've got a contact or a paper or somebody, uh, we'd certainly be interested in it. I mean, that's, you know, to bring up some kind of prototype instrument or, or something uh, to look at that, we'd be very interested in, uh, I think our professors are very well. Excuse me? Do you have an email address or website? Yes, uh, our website is uh, HTTP, the prefix for, um, it's www.lunacorp.com. Lunacorp is L-U-N-A-C-O-R-P. So, yeah, and that's updated regularly. Thank you. Okay, uh, any more questions? All right, uh, just this one last one, and then we'll uh, call it a day. Uh, this is a question for uh, Bob Zuber. Is there any uh, plan at all to build hardware for this? Or what? The only hardware work that's being done is ongoing work on uh, perfecting the systems to make propellant on Mars. And there are at this point three projects to do that. One's at the University of Arizona, one is at Lockheed Martin uh, in Denver, and one is at Pioneer Astronautics. <laughs> It only remains to uh, thank our panel for their uh, two questions.